Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we're once again going to be talking about streaming video games online. Now, if you're familiar with this topic already because you've seen other videos in this space where we have talked about the gray area in which video game streaming lives on the internet and elsewhere, the largesse that publishers are basically offering to streamers that say, hey, this might be illegal, this might technically be infringement, but it's okay because we're not going to do anything about it. If you know all about those things already, you can skip ahead to hopefully the next chapter, if I did this right, on this video, where we're going to actually talk about the substance of a new video sharing policy that video game publisher Capcom has put forth as of, I think it was this morning. Uh, if you don't know those topics, I would ask that you stick with us through the beginning here, the introduction section, because I do think it's important to understand the lay of the land, how these legal rights and obligations interact. I will try to do it quickly. As I said, we have other videos on this site that talk about these issues more fulsomely, but we need to have that foundation before we get into the whys as to why this Capcom policy might be better than nothing, but at the end of the day, it doesn't actually protect streamers in the way that if I were making my livelihood streaming video games, I would want to see it protected. So with that as our background, I want to give a few hat tips first to Justin Green at Anime Cowboy on Twitter said, hey, Hoglaw just caught this on Maximilian. I believe that's Maximilian Dude's stream. Initially not as bad as it could be, but really needs a walkthrough for potential problems. Talking again about this Capcom policy. I also got uh, a mention from Push Dustin who said, hey, check out this video on streaming and copyright infringement and fair use. I always appreciate this. And this flagged for me, this issue is one that people wanted to be talking about. As a matter of fact, when I opened up my Twitter this morning and I saw whatever it was, 20 plus notifications, I said, oh my gosh, what did I say? What did I do on Twitter? But as it turns out, a lot of people just flagged me on this particular topic. And this topic is framed as follows from Capcom USA. You can also see this reflected on other Capcom sites, other Twitter users, other social media users flagged this for me through, I believe it was Capcom Europe. Capcom now has a video policy in place. Please read carefully before your next video upload or live stream, which is why you're here. We're going to read this thing very carefully, lawyer carefully. But before we do, as I said, I want to talk about a few things. First of all, the way copyrights work. So when you create something, if you are Capcom and you create the next Mega Man, you create the next Street Fighter, whatever it might be, you get all of these rights to the copyrighted work. Now, Capcom's a Japanese company that you go through the Japanese Copyright Act, but through international treaties and the way that most of the Western societies work, these are going to be very similar concepts, even if not identical. So the copyright owner gets all of these exclusive rights, what we call the bundle of copyrights. They get the right to reproduce it. They get the right to create derivative works off it and you want to pay attention to that one because that's really what is happening when you're making a video about somebody else's content is you are creating a derivative of that thing that in some way is based on the value that was created by the original copyright holder you're creating that derivative work they get the exclusive right to distribute copies of it to perform it publicly now that's streaming Right When we talk about Twitch or Facebook gaming or YouTube gaming, whatever it might be where you're streaming something live, you are performing that work publicly, at least as far as the United States Supreme Court is currently concerned. So when you are talking about streaming, if you don't get these rights given to you by the copyright holder, you have to look for another way that you are using the materials. And the most common way that people refer to being allowed to use these things is what you might see on the internet called fair use. And this is a provision of the US code and other countries codes have similar concepts, not always called fair use that says, if you are using a copyrighted work in a fair way for purposes of things such as criticism, comment, news reporting, scholarship, research, that use of another party's copyrighted material is not by definition copyright infringement. So if your use is fair, it is not under the law infringing the copyright 
of another. And we get into fair use analysis. And unfortunately, people ask me this question all the time, but fair use analysis is enormously facts and circumstances intensive. And you can probably understand this intuitively if you think about it, right? In order to understand whether your use is fair, we have to examine things like the purpose and character of the use. Why are you doing this? Is it for profit? Commercial application is going to be a big thumb on the scales here. What's the nature of the copyrighted work? If it's just a picture of a building, if it's just a volcano exploding, if it's something in real life that nobody actually fully created themselves, then you are gonna get more of the benefit of the doubt that your use of it is commentary or news reporting or otherwise fair than if it's a fictional work, like say, a fighting game or another game that Capcom might otherwise create. The amount of what you use is super important. If you use the whole darn thing, if you stream the entirety of Resident Evil 2, that's different from taking clips and making comments and doing a review of that. And of course, the effect of the use upon the potential market is really based on, does your video, as we're talking about it right here, does it substitute for the act of buying the game itself? Will the existence of this video, perhaps a silent let's play, where you just play through the entirety of a Resident Evil game, does that negatively impact the market for Capcom to be able to sell their Resident Evil video game? I would say generally it does, but these are all facts and circumstances based. And worse than all of that, it's a defense. Right, So if you've got something that looks like it's infringement, but it's fair use, there is nothing illegal about the Capcoms of the world saying, I think that's infringement as long as they didn't just ignore the concept of fair use. And then you have to go through an actual court process. You have to pay lawyers, very expensive lawyers, to defend you. And only after that entire court adjudication has proceeded and you've all spent lots and lots of money, can you say, hey, I'm asserting that this is fair use. And that is not a cheap process at all. So when people rely on that, I get very nervous, which is one of the reasons why in virtual legality, we talk about trying to identify what if any rights at the copyright level, the actual copyright holder has granted to you as part of the software license. Now you might be familiar with this term, end user license agreement, EULA. These are the things that you generally click through. Maybe you scroll through if you're Activision and they make you scroll through all the pages that say all the things that you can and can't do with the software that has been provided to you. Predominantly, these things say, you can use one copy of this thing on the platform on which you bought it for non-commercial purposes and to play the video game and not to put it in a movie theater and sell out cover charges for 30 people and 30 of your friends and not to display it or publicly perform it because most of this EULA language was not written for a world in which Twitch and Facebook gaming and YouTube gaming really existed, but... Publishers and video game developers have found a very useful marketing avenue in Twitch and Facebook gaming and YouTube gaming and everywhere else. And so they like to allow it, but maybe not to grant an official license to do it. If we go and we look at some of Capcom's prior licenses, and unfortunately, and this often happens when we're online, it's very difficult to tell exactly what the current version of the Capcom end user license agreement is, but we can look at a couple versions and we can kind of triangulate that they've never really given a right to perform or publicly display to otherwise stream their video games. Their end user license agreement, I believe this is as of 2016, says something along the lines of, Capcom grants a non-exclusive license, meaning that they could sell a copy to another person, to users who install the program to their own personal computer, this was a PC Steam-based EULA, only for the purpose of playing the game for personal use, just as we talked about before. The intellectual property rights for the program belong to Capcom, or any legitimate third party that we might have licensed it from, and shall be protected under the Japanese Copyright Act, International Treaty, Convention, and any other applicable laws, including in the user's country of residence. And what's prohibited? The user shall be prohibited from doing the following acts. Any act which may infringe the intellectual property rights of Capcom. Any act, any commercial use of the program without the prior written permission of Capcom. You can't do anything that is infringing. It's fine if you're fair use, but you have to get to that place where you're defending it as fair use. And if it's not, then the actual license that you received from the copyright holder says, if you do these things, if you make a derivative work, if you publicly display it without their written permission, then you are infringing on their copyright and so they can do what they want against you in terms of civil copyright infringement, removing videos, issuing DMCA takedown notices, etc. 
We see this same kind of language used in what I could identify as the Monster Hunter World end user license agreement. So the version that I'm looking at is effective as of July 19th, 2016, but it appears to be the one that was most recently done. We see this same language. Any act which may infringe is otherwise prohibited, including modifications. Capcom doesn't allow you to modify their programs without infringing their copyright. Reverse engineer, decompilation, disassembly, extraction, attempt to discover source code, all the things that we would consider standard for actually protecting the function of the game, but now extend only to giving you the right to play it and not to do anything else with it. We see this mirrored again in an older version of the end user license agreement, at least I think it's older, where they reference CDs and DVDs, which are a little bit out of date, in which they say, we hereby grant to you a non-exclusive, non-transferable, revocable license to use the software solely in connection with playing the game. You may not, among other things, distribute, perform, or display any portion of the software, let alone creating derivative works. So Capcom has a relatively standard approach to this or has in the past that says you get to play the game and we give you no other legal rights. You see this again in the Capcom store where they actually have a little bit of language in the Capcom store terms of service that says subject to our end user license agreement, which again, we can't fully triangulate because of the way the internet works. You are not permitted to display, modify, create any derivative works based on or make any commercial use of the product you buy here. So this is Capcom's standard approach, which makes what they put out there this morning somewhat different. Now we're gonna get into this right now, and hopefully if I did this right, I'll start the chapter here so that everybody that's interested in talking about the specifics of this policy can join us at this point in time. But suffice it to say, this document does not change the license that you received when you purchase a Capcom piece of software. So you get that software, you license it under certain terms, and whatever that license looks like, it is very likely to be in the fashion of the ones we discussed in the prior section of this video, which means you got a right to play the game on your console or on your PC and not the right to do anything else. What this document is, is a written extension of their largesse. This is a policy, not rules, not even guidelines. This is what their currently preferred approach to video sharing is to be. They're putting this out there for the world because they understand the marketing value in having videos of their games out there. But as we will see in the language here, they make no real commitment to abiding by this policy. And there's a lot of ambiguity in the policy itself, which means if you are Maximilian Dude, if you are in the business of streaming fighting game clips or Capcom Resident Evil clips, or as is the case in my thumbnail, you just really love Phoenix Wright and wanna share that love with the world, this video policy doesn't give you the backstop that you would want it to. With that as the background, it's otherwise pretty reasonable, but it just doesn't actually serve as a foundational infrastructure on which to base your livelihood if that's what you're looking for from a document like this. Let's talk about the policy itself. First, we have Capcom saying we encourage your creativity and ask you to follow the guidelines below. Please note the following guidelines only apply to intellectual property owned by Capcom. For anything related to content owned by third parties, you must check with the proper rights holders. Now that jumped out at me with specificity in the case of Capcom. Why? Well, if you know Capcom games, you know that Capcom doesn't own the intellectual property rights to everything that it otherwise uses in the works that it creates. I pulled up a screenshot now of Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. You can see the cover of this title. How many pieces of intellectual property on this cover does Capcom not own? And that doesn't mean they didn't license the rights to put Iron Man in their video game. 100% of course they did, but there's a difference between licensing and ownership, which of course Capcom knows because they're in the business of making license agreements with their end users as well as with the people that provide them the rights to things like Iron Man. So when you've got a line like this, it becomes kind of odd. Right, they don't own the rights to Iron Man, but they do own the rights to the work that they created, the Marvel game that includes Iron Man. Do they actually intend to say you have to go figure out what Marvel wants to do with Iron Man as he appears in Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite? I don't think so. But again, these are lawyers being overly aggressive and ambiguous in the terminology because at the end of the day, what they want is for Capcom to have the right to do whatever it likes while still simultaneously looking like they are putting forth an olive branch to those that would stream really on their behalf. Now, here's the guidelines themselves. Creative content. 
You may make walkthroughs, tutorials, let's plays, speed runs, reviews, reactions, instructionals, and other commentary style videos using our game footage to be shared on video streaming sites. The associated step-by-step -step commentary, you see the stolen base there? They, they only reference commentary style videos and then they say, well, we are assuming that there will be step-by-step -step commentary tied to the live gameplay being shown and should provide instructional or educational value. You say, okay, so can I just have a humor Twitch stream? Can I just stream this game and have fun with my friends and show off how much fun we're having? Presumably Capcom would say, yes, if that helps our sales, we don't care. But note that it doesn't actually fit within the contours of this bullet statement where they're talking about step-by-step -step commentary to what is being shown of an instructional or educational nature. Now, they still reserve the right to allow whatever they want or other benefits, maybe humor, maybe entertainment, maybe all that's fine. But at the end of the day, what they want to say is you are only allowed to make these commentary style videos with this step-by-step -step commentary tied to live gameplay. What's interesting about that is if you're following along at home, that really winds up matching a lot of the fair use criteria, which of course, if you're under fair use, you don't actually need to comply with any of this, right? Fair use in and of itself is non-infringing, but it's very hard and very costly to defend, especially against a well-resourced entity. So we get into this constant gray area battlefield in intellectual property, now in video game streaming, where neither side is fully aware of the contours of their rights or obligations, but one side has a lot more money than the other. So Capcom says, hey, only these things are allowed. Maybe those match up with fair use, but this is all we want. Game footage posted online. You should not share game footage online without adding your own video or content. They don't just want raw streams up there unless the game console or device permits sharing of game footage. Now, that's an interesting bit of language, again, ambiguous. We think this is aimed pretty obviously at the Xbox sharing function, at the PlayStation sharing function. But if you're playing it on the PC, is there anything that your PC doesn't permit in terms of sharing of game footage, do they mean to lock this to platforms? Like what Steam allows, what GOG allows? Maybe, but your device in the context of this sentence is actually your PC, so I can hook up an Elgato to anything I want, and then I can share the game footage. Again, I wouldn't test that theory because Capcom definitely doesn't mean that, but what they're trying to get at is they don't want raw footage. Now, what's interesting about that is, you know, Let's Plays. Let's Plays I usually think of, on YouTube at least, as being at least somewhat quiet endeavors. Maybe that's because I'm primarily watching strategy games uh, as videos or things along those lines. And they're designed to really highlight the game more than the commenter. And so they say those are allowed, but they demand step-by-step -step commentary. And they say you can't just share game footage without adding something of your own. If you're a PC game player, does that mean you have to have a video content? Do you have to have something like we've got here in virtual legality, which is effectively a card that shows what it is that we're talking about and only has one big block? That is maybe the video game content from Capcom. Don't know. You've got those ambiguities, and we will see later in this policy why that's a potential problem. Fan content may not be promoted as official. No objections here. That's That makes total sense because Capcom can't control what it's associated with. They don't want anybody to say this comes from Capcom. Only Capcom music. Please note that some game soundtracks or songs may not be owned by Capcom, but instead are licensed from an artist or another group. As this varies from game to game, please be aware that music may trigger content flags and potential removal of the video. Game soundtracks may not be posted or distributed separately and apart from game footage. That actually matches this blue part that I didn't highlight. You may not split our game content into components and distribute those components. You can't pull the music soundtrack, put it up on YouTube. You can't take one of uh, Chun-Li's sound effects and somehow add it to your Twitch stream. Capcom doesn't want those things separated. It's a holistic product. And again, that makes sense for their protection. Only Capcom Music is an understandable phrase here. Hey, we're going to license some of this stuff in. We don't know when it'll get flagged on Twitch, but I find it wholly unacceptable in 2021 now for video game companies to effectively say, we licensed it in, we didn't pay for streaming rights for this music, and so, hey, maybe you'll get in trouble. We don't know and just leave their streamers out in the lurch when we know that Twitch streamers have just had effectively a music apocalypse when the music companies came after them for stuff that they either thought they had the rights to or didn't care or Twitch didn't warn them about. Now they have some inclination that they need to be concerned about that stuff, but Capcom's apparently offering no guidance. Hey, when you play this game, we probably own a lot of the music, but some of it we might not own, so good luck. 
is not really a stance that I love from a company like Capcom, which at bare minimum should be offering options like the ones we saw in the much beleaguered Cyberpunk 2077 that has a button that says, turn off the extra music that we don't have the licenses to display, promote, stream, etc. Audience appropriate is another one that makes sense. All fan created content should be appropriate for the audience of the Capcom games. For example, if you take game content for younger audience and make it objectionable, we reserve the right to take it down, which is a little bit of superfluous language. As we will see, they reserve the right to take anything down. But this makes sense again. The one piece of ambiguity here that I would point out is, do you mean all Capcom games have some kind of universal, everyone uh, is allowed to play them and we have to aim everything at a four quadrant kind of appeal? Or do you mean that your content can reflect the, let's say ESRB rating, Peggy rating, whatever it might be, of the content in question? Can my Resident Evil stream be a bit more spicy than my Phoenix Wright stream? Which I think is T for teen, maybe. Uh, either way, do we have to have everything available for everyone or can we start to tailor these to what the game actually is? Capcom doesn't say, it just says the audience of the Capcom games. So it's an interesting question. Then we get into a couple of areas where our, my personal bugaboos, as you probably know if you've been in virtual legality, and this is unreleased material. And these game companies trying to strike things down as copyright infringement that are very clearly not copyright infringement. And here Capcom kind of lets its flag fly here that it's going to do exactly that. Any posting or other unauthorized disclosure of game content prior to a game's official release is strictly prohibited. Note what that sentence is doing. Posting of game content is its own thing. You put a screenshot up, you find a trailer for a game that wasn't otherwise released, you've got a copy of the game early and you start streaming it. That's perhaps one thing. Other unauthorized disclosure is something entirely different. And we saw this with Cyberpunk, we saw this with Last of Us Part Two. we saw it with Sony and CD Projekt Red and their respective games, that they said that commentary, commentary on their games was something that they could strike down as infringement of copyright. Actually not using necessarily screenshots, not using video clips, just mentioning things like the words golf club in the case of Last of Us Part 2 was something that Sony was going through Twitter and social media and striking down. And it's one of the reasons I did a long form series on how this was a ridiculous application of the copyright laws. Why? Because you still have fair use and fair use says very specifically at least in the united states the fact that a work is unpublished shall not itself bar a finding of fair use it will help the copyright holder try to establish that fair use shouldn't apply due to purpose and character or nature of the copyrighted work or what have you but it doesn't mean that fair use isn't capable of being applied to the use in question. And so saying that any unauthorized disclosure of game content, hey, I now know that Mega Man appears in Resident Evil 4 Remake. I don't know that, by the way. I'm just using a hypothetical. Saying that line should not result in me getting some kind of con uh, confirmation of infringement placed against me by Capcom. And they double down on this in the next section, as we will see. Even after an official game release, spoilers can ruin a fan's experience and we always aim to avoid them. Please be respectful of others and do not deliberately push plot reveals on people who are actively avoiding learning about them. Otherwise, please offer spoiler disclaimers as a courtesy. Now that language, if you might note, doesn't actually sound legal in nature. It doesn't talk of a prohibition. It doesn't talk of a penalty. But in a document like this, policies like this, where we will see they reserve the right to take down whatever they deem to be objectionable, it certainly does sound like a bit of a threat that says, hey, if you start to spoil anything, then we might come down against you. And if you're making your livelihood on one of these services, you're talking about strikes, you're talking about things where they might be able to claim infringement, you have to start taking these things pretty seriously. That doubling down that I mentioned before appears here in no commercialization. We do not allow Capcom content and other materials uh, to be used to make money or to gain any other financial benefit except through permissible monetization described below, which says you may monetize through partner programs and or advertising from YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, or other video game sharing services. Collecting voluntary contributions such as through Super Chat on YouTube and bits on Twitch is permitted as long as your video is also available for free to the public on YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, Twitter, or other video sharing services. Now, that doubling up of the pre-release content is actually below, so I apologize for that. But on no commercialization, most of this makes sense, right? We don't allow commercial use. We saw that in their end user license agreement samples, 
but we're going to make an exception, not through your license. It just means we're going to accept. We're not going to try to bring a content infringement claim against you. We're not going to sue you for copyright infringement. If you monetize through a video sharing service or you collect money through those video sharing services. Now, what's interesting there is Patreon or YouTube membership or other things that have effectively a paywall, right? I long sponsored the Easy Allies. I love their work and I've watched a lot of their videos. One of the things they do is a show called Spoiler Mode in which they might go through, for instance, the contents of a game like Resident Evil 3. This would seem to suggest to me that since that spoiler mode is Patreon only, you actually have to give them money through Patreon in order to access the full version of that video, that if they were to use Resident Evil clips in that discussion on spoiler mode, they might run afoul of this as not being available for free to the public on YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, Twitter, or other video sharing services. Now, from a practical perspective, the reason Patreon exists is because people weren't getting the money that they wanted out of Twitch or YouTube or Facebook, and they have membership that wants to pay for the same content that advertisement wasn't supporting. So there isn't a functional difference as to how these things are created or performed at most levels. But this would say that that, a spoiler mode with video clips, is infringement when, if that were just put up publicly on YouTube, it wouldn't be. And that's a kind of unique circumstance, and I think it's something that creators are going to have to be aware of in terms of paywalls, in terms of other ways that they might be getting funded. You really can't do that as far as Capcom is concerned without running a follow this policy, and it's something to pay, att pay attention to. Otherwise, this section makes a lot of sense. Impermissible uses. Any posting or other disclosure of unofficially released, unauthorized, or leaked video and other leaked content of any kind in any format is strictly prohibited. Now again, you're only bound to them to the extent that you're not operating under fair use, that you've otherwise signed a license agreement for the content that has fallen into your hands. So this is language that is stronger than necessary. We've talked about this in the past in virtual legality. If you watch American football, you know the NFL likes to make these kinds of comments in the commercials saying any account of this game is prohibited, which obviously isn't the case. You can talk about that game you just watched after the fact and the NFL police are not going to put you in NFL prison. This is similar kind of concept that says as, hey, it's strictly prohibited, except they know darn well fair use is okay. And if you don't have any other binding category, you're allowed to share information that's been leaked. Heck, journalists throughout the entertainment media have been focused on leaked materials in movies and television and elsewhere for as long as those media have been around. These video game companies are trying to get away from that, but language like this won't succeed. We may authorize pre-release content to a select group for media review or other agreed upon business purposes accompanied by strict guidelines for any content released prior to the official release date. Hey, we know we're banning you from having this stuff out there on your stream service, on virtual legality, on your Twitch channel, wherever it might be. But do know we're going to give copies to people that we like and they're allowed to do what they want. But we'll have them under NDAs of some kind so that you can't get any negative information they might want to share with you out there. So don't worry about any of that. Pre-release content, they don't like it, but can they stop it? It depends. A lot of these companies are abusing the DMCA to try to do that. We'll see what Capcom does in the future. Unauthorized usage. Again, this one makes a lot of sense to me. We do not allow usage of or promotion of third-party programs or devices that circumvent intended protection of Capcom titles. Additionally, we do not allow Capcom content to be uploaded to a platform for which rights have not been granted, such as in the creation of Twitch emotes featuring Capcom content. <clears throat> now, if you look at this particular issue, this brings to mind a video that I did last year about Nintendo striking down a Super Smash Brothers tournament because it was using a modification to their code base called Slippy that allowed essentially online multiplayer to be used, and I think it was Super Smash Brothers Melee. So Capcom is effectively reserving the same right to say, hey, we can come down on video tournaments, we can come down on streams that use anything that modify what is in our programs. Any usage of third-party programs can be struck under this policy, and that's the kind of thing that tournament organizers and creators in the fighting game space especially are going to want to pay attention to because this is the very same thing that Nintendo folks got in trouble with. The second part of this is also interesting. We do not allow Capcom content to be uploaded to a platform for which rights have not been granted. Obviously, 
too broad and vague for what they intend here because the parenthetical says, hey, we don't allow Twitch emotes, which means they haven't granted certain rights to Twitch, which if we were to take their sentence to the fullest extreme would mean we don't allow Capcom content to be uploaded to Twitch because Twitch is a platform for which at least certain rights have not been granted. They definitely don't mean that. And furthermore, what they do mean is a little bit difficult for a creator, for people on this side of the opaque wall, to parse. How are we supposed to know whether Capcom has licensed Twitch the right to make Twitch emotes out of Capcom content? We know it in this parenthetical that that specific case is not allowed, but for other cases, we just don't know. And Capcom says, we don't allow it. So if we come down against you and we didn't license that, well, then you're just in trouble. Fair enough, Capcom, but it does very little to make me rest easy if I'm otherwise streaming Capcom games. Inappropriate content. And this is one of those areas that we've talked about in virtual legality a lot. This is entirely justified from the company's standpoint to say we don't want our stuff to be attached to bad things, but the vagueness and the breadth of this language should give everyone pause. Using Capcom titles to create video and other content, including mods, that is, and here's a list of bad things, illegal, sure, racist, sexist, prejudicial to sexual orientation, sexually explicit, disparaging, promotes hate crimes, or is otherwise offensive, is not tolerated. You can see the areas here that I've highlighted in red, but the most ambiguous here are disparaging and otherwise offensive. We've seen that language in the CDA when we start talking about protections under the law, and we've seen it in the DMCA itself that these companies or platforms in the case of those laws say we have the right to remove stuff that we find otherwise offensive. That's fine, but it's very, very broad. What is offensive to Capcom is not stated here. We can't know it. They might not know it until they're actually faced with the content in question. And so you're always taking a certain amount of risk. Disparagement is also a very kind of light word, not legally defined very well. That could mean basically anything. What are you disparaging? Are you disparaging the government, the United States government, the Japanese government, another person, another group, another company, Capcom itself, the video game? If you're disparaging the video game, you found Resident Evil 3 to be too short, can they strike you as infringing under this policy? I would argue that they can, and that's not the way anybody should want to live. Further, if we've got actual critiques of the game that are very biting, that Capcom as a company may disagree with. I've pulled up the Vice review, or at least commentary on Resident Evil 2, which has come up in this space a lot because it's an article I think a lot of people disagree with. I disagree with the substance, but I think the article should exist, that says things about police. It says the notion is wild. The police station is fortress safe haven is laughably naive particularly for people of color. It certainly was in the 90s as well. And really, when has policing in America ever actually been about keeping neighborhoods safe as opposed to keeping a racist status quo up and running? If this were part of a video, is this author calling Capcom racist? Are they calling the United States racist, municipalities, all police, just specific police? And can Capcom say, whoa, that's flying too close to the sun. We're going to strike it because we find it otherwise offensive, disparaging of groups or institutions. I would argue that they could. Capcom doesn't want to dip their toes in these waters, but people that create content need to know that these waters exist. Capcom then doubles down on this right. On a case-by-case -case basis, Capcom reserves the right to take down content that is found to be inappropriate or objectionable at our discretion. We are the final arbiters of this. Otherwise offensive, objectionable, disparaging, inappropriate, all super light water sandwich words that allow Capcom to do what it will. Failure to abide by these video content guidelines may result in Capcom taking action to have your video content removed, including content ID, strikes, and all very bad things that can happen on the platforms themselves. Capcom reserves the right to change these policies at any time and for any reason. Hey, by the way, this is a policy. These are guidelines. This is not part of your license. We can do whatever we want with it. Please note that this policy is not exhaustive and we reserve the right to object to any use of Capcom materials and to remove such objectionable content at our sole discretion. Now, this is the nuclear bomb 
in the actual policy. We've already talked about how ambiguous it is, how people aren't really getting the protections that they might otherwise want in a document of this type. And then we get the sentence, nothing that we said here is exhaustive. These aren't real rules. We reserve the right to object to any use of Capcom materials. We can decide we don't like you, Maximilian Dude. And I don't mean to pick on you. You're just the one that was referenced to me. And I know you cover Capcom fighting games. We object to you and your use of Capcom materials. And because this isn't part of a legal right granted to you under the license, it is by its nature infringing. And now you have 25 strikes against you, even though you want to say you were abiding by the policy. We point to this sentence and say, nah, we always reserve the right to object for any reason and to remove that content and to do the things through the DMCA, through the notice process, heck, through lawsuits that we can at our sole discretion. Please note, as a way of underlining that, that this policy is a guideline for using our footage. It is not intended to be, nor should it be considered as express permission, nor an official license or authorization for you to create mods or derivative works, which is what these videos are, of Capcom titles or content. Just to be entirely clear, and this is to Capcom's credit, because a lot of these companies put out a policy like this, put out a forum post like this, talk about these issues on the understanding that most people, non-lawyers, will have that this affects a legal right and says, no, it doesn't. Just to be clear, this is what we don't intend to prosecute. This is what we don't intend to bring a DMCA takedown notice against. But this is not a license to you to make videos. This is not a license to you to publicly perform our content or to display it or to otherwise stream it. We are not licensing that. This is our largesse. We are giving it to you by our leave and we can take it away at our discretion and we don't even have to follow this policy. This policy is not exhaustive. If you receive a violation claim from Capcom directly or through a video social media platform and believe it's an error, please submit it and we'll look at it. We'll check to see if we were wrong. Probably we weren't because we're going to check our own decision making and say, hey, that decision making was right on. But you can feel free to complain to us about it. That will be protective in certain respects on things like automatic algorithm takedowns uh, and things that Capcom might not be aware of are happening. But if they made a manual decision they're not likely to change their opinion based on you saying, we think you're wrong there. Could be wrong. Maybe Capcom will take a different tack. I would doubt there will be a lot of success there. So, unfortunately, we get to the end of this video. And as I said in my thumbnail, this is better than nothing. The current state of play before a video policy is enacted is an end user license agreement that says it's just flatly prohibited. That state of play didn't change with the enactment of a video policy like this but at bare minimum you now have a document that you can point to if push came to shove in a court of law you have a document you can point to to capcom that says hey i think i'm following these policy procedures what am i doing wrong you have political leverage insofar as if it's not obvious that you are doing something wrong if they're targeting you as a person you can bring that to games journalists or other journalists and say hey i think i'm following this policy and maybe get it reported on in that fashion but from a legal standpoint, and that's what we do here in virtual legality, effectively nothing has changed. This is a policy. It's not even guidelines, even though they refer to them as such. It's definitely not rules. It's definitely not legal contract rights. And as a policy, it effectively just says we are going to have these largesse contours in place, but we still can change them at any time. And so stream our stuff at your discretion, but with the knowledge that we can take it away and maybe take your channel away at any time. This has been another uplifting episode of Virtual Legality today. If you enjoyed this commentary, please do like, share, subscribe, ring the bell. Tell folks we're having these conversations. I think there are a lot of folks on Twitch, on Twitter, on social media in general, Facebook gaming, YouTube gaming that could be advised uh, by a walkthrough of this policy of this ilk. Otherwise, if you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.